Um, I feel tender. I'm a shy and introverted person. And um, just being in this space, in this room with some people I know, um, with all you beautiful people, even the ones I don't know, um, the tenderness multiplies. So first I wanna thank Lauren Bast for inviting me and AJ Wilmore for the work that they've done. Rosette Serrano, thank you for giving me back my own words. I think those of us who write or make or create often do the work and then leave it. And so it's an incredible gift for you to give me back my own words. Margaret Crawford, who I have long adored and to whom I am grateful for incredible thinking. And for this thing, school, temporary liveness. It's beautifully imagined. And Lauren, I will say to you now that um, I will come back and do anything without ever needing to be compensated because I think it's an incredible project and um, you ought to be acknowledged for that. I could also name other people, Ralph Lemon, who I only just met, but whose work has been so important to me, but I'm just going to start. Words and sentences. Why the sentence? Why the word? Because beholding black art requires a capacious formalism and attending to the pieces of the whole, the materiality that makes the liveliness of the object. Of course, thinking about formalism might raise at least three anxieties. One is the traditions of new criticism or deconstruction that enact formalism in ways that make it seem foreign to or antagonistic with Black literature. Two, that a turn to formalism ignores or obscures critical attention to the afterlife of transatlantic slavery and settler colonialism. That formalist practices in a way are too small for the heft of what black art tries to do and what we need it to do. And three, relatedly, that it might even be naive or something more dangerous to focus on sentences in a time of urgency and insurgency when the world is burning and raging. Of course, there's a tradition of black formalism, one that is amplified by someone like uh, Barbara Christian in the Race for Theory or Toni Morrison, others. There are indeed many traditions of black formalism, though my work now is especially interested in the critical tradition of some black women thinkers from the 1980s and 1990s. So I'm going to insist on thinking about sentences and trying to justify word work. Is the sound level okay? Yeah, uh, right. I could use Fred Moulton or Sylvia Winter to think about sentences and sentence matters, but I want to turn to our Dean of Black Aesthetics, Hortense Spillers. We often read Spillers for her one iconic essay on the scene of subjection and trauma, Mama's Baby. But Spillers, even in that essay, and certainly beyond it, studies intently and regularly around aesthetics. In the introductory essay to her collection, Black, White, and in Color, an essay titled Peter's Pans, Eating in the Diaspora, Spillers considers the form, formative capacity of Black studies, its limits, and its conceptual possibility. Early in this essay, she writes this brilliant thing. The puzzle remains how an oxymoron with an actual and material dimension is to be expressed when it lays hold of a cultural semantics rather than a locality of sentences. Even if we grasp a general economy of practices all at once, it can still only be said bit by bit and part by part. Locality of sentences, 
bit by bit, part by part, which is to say that sentences might be a possibility for a particular kind of Black studying, even that sentences might be the purest possibility because of their localized intensity, their rhetorical enfleshment of the metaphorization and meditation and mediation that is Blackness itself. In that claim, I'm borrowing some of the words that Spillers uses, so let me make it clear. She writes, even though it seemed that there was only slight difference between the subjects of activism and the subjects of meditation mediation, there actually yawned enough of a spatiotemporal beance or break between one and another to give birth to anxieties of displacement and misorientation simultaneously emergent with the event itself. Throughout this essay, Spillers is cautioning us against thinking that the activism that gives rise to Black studies surpasses or resolves Blackness as a figure of study. Meditation and mediation. These are terms of rhetoric and of the sentence itself, and they are in Spillers' imagination essential to the work of studying Blackness. I want to pause and say that part of what I'm trying to articulate is the way in which Spillers is thinking about the object that is Black study. We think we know the object, we think the object is self-evident, but she's trying to press us to think about that object. Her investment and mine in language work is about thinking through the how and what of Black study. She continues, Black writers must retool the languages that they inherit. The work of the logological refashioning not only involves the dissipation of the poisons of cliche and its uncritical modalities, but it also takes a stab at the pulsating infestations that course through the grammars of race on Blackness in particular. Spiller then is asserting Blackness as a critical posture. We don't come to Blackness we don't come to Blackness in security. We come to it to do critical work to try to understand indeed what Blackness is. The sentence for Spillers is a place to locate the struggle to stay as close to the preciseness of the word, its force, but it's also a way to hold fidelity to the distinction between Blackness as it is lived in the human who is Black and Blackness that becomes an occasion for thought. That in an anti-Black world is the most difficult thing to try to do because those two things get collapsed. Anti-Blackness collapses those two things, takes studying out of the project and work and labor of those of us who do it. Spillers wants to be sure not to enact a simplistic collation of Black identity and Black study. During the q and I have an iconic, anecdotal, terrible story that I can tell you about this collation. I'm going to show this next slide only because of what's at the end, though I won't read the entire thing, which is that Spillers writes, the stylistic elements of the idiomatic were and remain for me a political choice in as much as I have wanted as a criti critical theoretical practitioner to surprise the most blatant of the racist presumptions that invade every field of discourse. What I love about that moment is the way in which Spillers is articulating then that the project of the preciseness of her language work is a project that has in it a kind of politic. Spillers thinks on the level of the sentence. She theorizes on the level of sentence. And that doing is motivated by the capacities of rhetoric and syntax, by the necessities of Blackness as the discursive made material and the material made discursive. The sentence for Spillers is a site of a kind of Black specificity, Black tautness, Black proximity, Black enactment and creativity. Black vitality, Black thought work, Black work, Black art. The sentence is a site of Black art. It is a kind of Black aesthetic inhabitants. 
Let me pause and say that Spillers' investment in the sentence collates with her arguments about Black intellectual production, elaborated finely and extensively in her essay, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. There, she explores the trouble of the object of study in Black studies, a trouble that arrives through the uncritical ideation of community, community which is a material impossibility, community which fractures under the weight of the distinction between the grim realities that remain about that remain the condition of black life and the distance that some of us who write and think about black life have from those grim realities community for spillers then becomes the spectral object of the object of black study community becomes the spectral object of the object of Black study, such that the intellectual's work is always organized by trying to justify her isolation from this fictive community. Spillers writes, perhaps the purest object that the Black creative intellectual always imagines as the unmediated thereness is situated in his or her concept of NATO community. But in my view, the time has come for us to rethink community if we dare, precisely as an object of knowledge, beginning with our false relations to it as an unchanging same. It's important to acknowledge that Spillers knows and that I know that the news concerning African-American life, uh, African-American life world generally is quite grim. So I want to make sure you understand that neither she nor I are naive about the political conditions. In a way, it is Spillers' astuteness to the enduring grimness of things that seems to intensify her commitment to the specific clarity of what the creative intellectual can do. And here, if you know um, some of the work of Alexander Wahalia in Habeas Fiscus, who's trying to rethink the object that is Black study, or Robin Wiegmans in Object Lessons in thinking um, about object of study in women's studies, you might hear um, some resonance there. Spillers is interested in the matter of Black intellectual and creative agency. The many impediments to the freedom to think the thoughts that constitutes intellectual and creative doing. She writes, the Black creative intellectual then is rarely afforded the occasion of the moment clean. Either he or she will be reminded, will remind himself or herself or someone else will of the big picture. So let's say the material scene through which he or she is moving. The very ability to differentiate oneself as an intellectual worker under the historicizing conditions of African-American culture long constituted in and by dominance as a mute facticity and tactility has barely been achieved by African-Americans across that life, the life world. And what Spiller sets up in making this case is she takes the example, it's in a footnote, like footnote 12 in this very long essay. She offers up the example of the musician. And she says, the musician is clear about their object of study. It is the instrument. And that is the thing through which they're trying to manifest something. And the, in the instrument becomes, there's almost like a relationality that happens between the musician and the uh, instrument. And she asks, so therefore, what is the instrument or object for the Black creative intellectual? A phrase she's using more generally to think about the Black scholar. And she's thinking about what makes um, the designation of a clear object so difficult for those of us who are, I would just generally say, Black literary scholars. One way in which she punctuates then this argument is the short answer is that the Black creative intellectual must get busy where he or she is. There is no other work. This comes after a moment of her, again, thinking about the kind of political and social life world and saying, well, what should we do? And she says the short answer is one must get busy where you are. And to me, 
where one is, is often in word work or in the sentence. Part of what's at work in Spiller's thinking and certainly also in my own is this question of, um, of trying to understand black thinking as black work. There is such a historical imperative, a historical misunderstanding, a historical, it's as if black thought is dissonant to the idea of black work because we expect a material, a materialization, something visible and legible. Those of us who come from working poor, working class context, immigrant context, and so on, who are doing academic work, or anyone who's an artist, it is not unlikely that someone will ask you, well, what are you doing? Think about how hard it is to represent thinking such that in documentaries or films, when the writer is thinking, they show a typewriter or a person looking like this, because we don't have, for as much as the modern Western world seems to be interested in thought, we don't have useful common sense ways of thinking about what thinking looks like. So we undervalue thinking. And that undervaluation of thinking is heightened because of the way in which blackness seems to exist in contradistinction to what thinking is. And that black creativity is always seen as if it emanates from a body that is not doing thinking, but that is just thinking. Except we know from artists, from any person, from people on the street who are trying to dance their way through the world, that thinking is happening all the time. Spillers then says this thing that I love. Ah. Sorry. In order to say the not sayable, I must say, I must enter the chain of significant differences inscribed by the sentence. Spillers's provocations about sentences extend to how she thinks about the sermon, which is the move I want to make. That is, in part of the work I'm trying to do, I'm trying to think about reading, what kind of act reading is, what kind of artistic and intellectual act reading is, and whether I can conceptualize reading as a thing that we can understand as a black critical praxis. And to do that, one of the ways I'm entering that is to think through Spillers' thinking about the sermon. Spillers' provocations about sentences extend to how she thinks about the sermon as a kind of technology of black empowerment. That is, the sermon becomes a praxis of the potency and the locality of the rhetorical. In her essay, Moving On Down the Line, Variations on the African-American Sermon, Spillers once again comes to the question about the formation of community as it relates to language work. Forgive this quick glossing I'm about to do. I'm just trying to set up maybe four points about this essay that I think are most important to share with you today. The first is that um, at the beginning of the essay, Spillers arrives at, the at a conclusion about the Black churches in the American South via comparison of the great churches of Europe. It's a moment where her speaker is in Italy and is looking up at the fantastic art and design of the great church and comes to this realization uh, of how that that structure, that architecture does a certain kind of technological work to orient the people who would be there and how that's different than the modest churches of the American South, which people like her own father built with their own hand in the 1920s and 30s. So she writes this thing. I won't read all of it. I think I will, um, maybe I'll read all of it. What the Feast of the Gays is to the great churches of Europe the feast of hearing is to the church of the insurgent and dispossessed. In the former, the great churches of Europe, the eye initiates a vault, a leap of faith. In the church of the insurgent, the hierarchy of the ecclesia of the political body is raised as nuance is stripped down to its bare necessary minimum. In this church of democratic norms, attested to by far humbler architectural display. The listening ear 
becomes the privileged central organ as the sermon attempts to embody the word. She then continues at the end, the sermon attempts to embody the word, body, word, suture together, I'll come back to that. She ends that opening moment with the African-American church therefore sustains a special relationship of attentiveness to the literal word that liberates. Attentiveness to the literal word that liberates. For Spillers, in the small insurgent church, the body and the word are sutured into a kind of ecology that surpasses architecture. It is in this regard that she can hypothesize that the preacher and the sermon are the first run event of the African-American critical subject position in the new world. This proposition helps to secure the idea of the sermonic word as particular to black insurgency. That is, Spillers wants to dramatize black culture's special relationship of attentiveness to the literal word that liberates. This is one of those moments where I wanna say something snarky about the ridiculousness of new criticism, thinking that it owns how we understand what word work and close reading is. That's as much snarkiness as I will say. <laughs> Spillers goes on to explore the dynamism of the sermon, advocating that the sermon is community as potentiality that the reader, and it's so important that she refers to the people who are hearing the sermon as readers. Uh, she does this because I think she's trying to open up our common sense discourse about literacy because we assume that hearing is a demoted way of engaging the world. And we also assign the idea of literacy to certain people who can't read. And so what Spillers is trying to do is to acknowledge the dynamic way in which the people who would be hearing a sermon are participating in what we understand as a reading practice, which is a, a discerning and intellectual practice. So she calls them readers. She doesn't explain why she does that. It's just one small thing she does that might in my life would be a whole year of work. And she just does this thing. It's incredible. She refers to the congregants as readers, even as they're hearing the sermon, which means she's extending the epistemology of literacy. So that the reader is engaged in an experience of wrestling with the word and wrestling with the shared communion of being with others in that wrestling. That the reader is engaged in an experience of wrestling with the word and wrestling with the shared communion of being with others in this wrestling. Let me mark just two more insights that seem most relevant to thinking about the sermon. The first is Spillers' claim about the sermon's paradox. She writes, an aspect of the sermon's miracle is that its audience already knows that there is no suspended or ironic conclusions to the tales that the sermon project. In fact, there's only one sermonic conclusion, and that is the ultimate triumph over defeat and death that the resurrection promises. This is an incredible irony, one that she refers to as the revelation of an already anticipated subject and outcome that Roland Barthes might call the hermeneutic narrative. What I love about the fact that the sermon has no surprise is that it amplifies even more the reading practice and the workfulness of those who are reading the sermon. You already know what, where the sermon is headed. And so what kind of work then is the one who is listening and reading it doing in that encounter? What kind of alert, attentive, transformative thing is happening if they are not being given the word, but rather in a way reading the word for themselves. It, it is a revelation in how we might think again about a practice of literacy. The second quick point, near the end of the essay, after reading through the sermons of John Wesley Edward Bowen, who's a Methodist clergyman and 19th century black intellectual, Spillers argues for the sermon as a technology of black empowerment, or at least that's how I phrase it. And she writes this thing that deserves to be read carefully out loud. At this place of fracture, 
we listen attentively for the moving line that is made articulate to living. In this case, the shamanic word does not soar, it does not leap, it never leaves the ground. It scatters instead through the cultural situation and like the force of gravity holds us fast to the mortal means. Bound to this earth by the historical particularity of the body's wounding, bound to this earth by the historical particularity of the body's wounding, the community comes face to face with the very limit of identity, the indomitable, irredeemable otherness of death, metaphorized in this instance by the institution of slavery. But this apparent fatality in binding speakers and hearers, readers to the material situation quickens us all the more to the radicalizing move. I'm stunned by this idea of the moving line, this formulation of the moving line as an episteme for collating word and body and transgression. I'm stunned by the sense of the body rather than transcending, rather than arising to the height, almost falling more deeply, sustaining its weight into and near the ground, which is a way in which I think Spillers is how asking us to think about the relationship of the word to making the body bear its own weight. Um, there's a footnote I could say about someone like Nahum Chandler, who thinks about writing and thinking as a form in his reading of Du Bois, but I'm instead going to turn to the fact that in conceptualizing word work as black work, Spillers is in company with Toni Morrison, especially how Morrison theorizes the role and agency and responsibility of the reader by imagining that the reader in her encounter with reading becomes a writer. If you know Morrison's oeuvre, this was an important part of Morrison's project. And here, um, the Canadian scholar um, Michael Nowlin has an essay called Jazz and the American Writer. It's one of the most um, beautiful scholarly essays I've ever read. And he thinks a lot about Morrison's conceptualization of the reader or Morrison's demand of American letters that there be a new reader who becomes capable of reading her work. In doing this, in imagining the reader as a writer, Morrison makes reading an active act, a responsibility, and she surpasses the semantic crisis where the black reader is statically objectified in the text, but not imagined to have to do the intellectual work of being with the text, right? This is part of the semantic crisis of American imagination where black literature is not, a, is not there for black, for black readers to read because it's there to do this other kind of national nation state work and where the white reader is imagined to be passively invited to the experience of the text spectacle of Black life. This is Morrison's project through Playing in the Dark, through her essay, Rememory, through her Nobel lecture, through the essay that Michael Nowlin, who I just mentioned, um, uh, describes. This is Morrison trying to make us astute to reading as a kind of creative intellectual work. I'm advancing an aesthetic frame for thinking about critical practice, to think about being moved by a work of art, its feeling and impact, even being thrown into a moment of becoming as if reading is a phenomenology. And here I'm thinking with Toni Morrison, who in a 1981 interview with Thomas Leclerc, in response to his question, he asks her, you said that you would write even if there were no publishers. Would you explain what the process of writing means to you? And Morrison says, and I'm only going to read the part that's highlighted. She says, while I'm writing, all of my experience is vital and useful and possibly important. It may not appear in the work, but it is valuable. Writing gives me what I think dancers have on stage in their relation to gravity and space and time. It is energetic and balanced, fluid and in repose. And there is always the possibility for growth. I can never hit the highest note, so I'd never have to stop. 
remember this when I come to the very end of the talk. In emphasizing reading as an apparatus for thinking about thinking, reading as an apparatus for thinking about thinking, I'm engaging this central tenet of Morrison's theorization of writing. Oh, Morrison's words. I want to break away from certain assumptions that are inherent in the conception of the novel form to make a truly oral novel, she says, another interview from 1981, in which there are so many places and spaces for the reader to work and participate. I'll jump to the bottom. I would like to do better at this one thing and to try to put the reader in the position of being naked and quite vulnerable, nevertheless trusting to rid him of all of his literary experience and all of his social experiences in order to engage him in that novel. What might not be entirely clear is that I'm trying to insert Morrison and Spillers into a discourse in the 1970s and 1980s about reading and reading practices. I'm trying in a way to, to put them forth as practitioners of a kind of black formalist tradition that has uh, maybe been somewhat understudied. Um, and also in doing that, I'm trying to animate the idea of reading, the thing I think we take for granted as a kind of critical intelligence. I'm gonna skip the next slide and go instead to this quotation from Patricia Williams. Patricia Williams in The Alchemy of Race and Rights says this thing about the sentence and reading that I think is quite resonant with Spillers and Morrison. She writes, I'm trying to create a genre of legal writing to fill the gaps of traditional legal scholarship. I would like to write in a way that reveals the intersubjectivity of legal constructions that forces the reader both to participate in the construction of meaning and to be conscious of that process. Thus, in attempting to fill the gaps in the discourse of commercial exchange, I hope that the gaps in my own writing will be self-consciously filled by the reader as an act of forced mirroring of meaning invention. To this end, I exploit, I exploit all sorts of literary devices, including parody, parable, and poetry. Just to say what I'm sure is clear, that Morrison and Spillers and Williams are not alone in this invention of a critical lexicon and critical praxis. Indeed, they are outstanding members of an outstanding vanguard of thinkers in what we might name as classic Black literary feminism. Thinkers like Barbara Christian and Claudia Tate and Spillers and Nellie McKay and Cheryl Wall and Deborah McDowell and Andrew Seal and Hazel Carby and Carol Boyce Davies and Madhu Dubé, all of whom are diligent practitioners of Black critical formalism. Okay, at the heart of Spillers' investment and mine in the sentence is the fact that thinking is hard to materialize, it's hard to represent, and it's hard to value. And in the general history of racialized capitalism in regard to Blackness, where doing and performing and enacting resonates more readily, but not as an intelligence of the Black one who's doing and performing and enacting, but as a confirmation of the over-ideation of the body as being beyond thought, which we know is not true. This racist inertness that lurks in Black doing, performing, and enacting. So I'm interested then in what kind of doing is thinking? What kind of Black doing is thinking? And how can it be conceptualized as work? I've long thought that I wanted to write a book about love and a book about dance. 30 years ago, as a graduate student, I titled my dissertation with those two words in them. I may never write that book, but what lurks in my own study still, and this question, is wanting to write about love and dance, because I think those two things help me to understand this question I'm taking up now. That is, I'm trying to explore three questions. What kind of act is thinking? What kind of act is writing? And what is the work of Black criticism? Uh, 
this is no small thing, this thinking about the Black critic's subjectivity. And so I turn to Robert Reed Farr, who says the striking thing about form that coheres beautifully, that coheres beautifully with my interest in sentences and in form. I'm nearly done. Um, Robert E. Farr writes, it is profoundly difficult to remember and memorialize heroic victories and pitiful defeats while bombs continue to fall and pestilence steadily seeps from subway sewers. Strange to con contemplate the relics of a glorious past while steadily negotiating the rigors of an inglorious present. No matter. The masters gave careful instructions in how to overcome obstacles and salve the marks of defeat. We are continually reminded to relinquish the self-interested desire to celebrate solely the content of our productions. Instead, our focus must ever remain on form. Neither my name nor yours for that matter is likely to be etched in granite. We can, however, work to reproduce the technique of the artisan who takes the chisel into his hands. Or, as Audre Lord urges us, the quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. The quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through these lives. This is an aesthetic calculus. Lord is asserting an aesthetic calculus as the thing that enacts our capacity to act and to be rightly ethical. This is black sentence work. This is a call to black sentence work. And now one quick turn and then three quick conclusions. A turn to a practice of black formalism to consider what's possible in close reading in the ordinary excellence of close reading. Keep in mind as I read this next section, the phrase mere beauty, mere beauty. First, let's notice the use of color and of ecstatic detail. The pinks in As American as Apple Pie, four or five different tones that shimmer in the shoes and the skirt and the flamingo cup and the Barbie shirt. And then suddenly the earrings and especially the sunglasses where pinks exist as striations of reflection on the lens. There are pinks everywhere even in the hood and side of the car, in the stripe around the male figure's shoes. These pinks are one example of the rich palette that Amy Sherald enacts in her paintings. The colors are vibrant, saturated, intense, radiant, almost as if, as if each hue gestures towards its genealogy, as if one pink begets another. And if we pay attention to the pinks, then we encounter the exquisite detail that makes them work, such as the range of shading in the skirt's pleats, how this specific fineness gestures to other instances of shading. Look, for example, at how the two faces are represented, how the rendering of the waves in the male figure's hair mimics the rendering of the layers of curl in the female figure's or how distinct the skin of cheek or neck is made to be. This detail of shading is not insignificant since it is a way to experience the piece as a whole. Sherald's aesthetic devotion, that word is severely important, devotion. Sherald's aesthetic devotion to detail lives not just in her deployment of color, but also in her compositional attentiveness to the small moments, as in the striated light reflected in a pair of sunglasses. This reflection seems like an especially apt metaphor for the quality of light that Cheryl brings to the representation of her subjects, as if we are being asked to behold them with a particular rigor, a deliberate seriousness. You know this, 
It was Audre Lorde who wrote of light's quality as essential to how we understand and live our human lives. Lorde names the quality of light. Lord names the quality of light as an apparatus not only for seeing, but also as an apparatus for beholding. She moves seeing away from the enlightenment peril of visuality into something about beholding, extending apprehension beyond measure or judgment and into the realm of something spiritual and philosophical, the quality of light by which we scrutinize. Cheryl's use of detail is synonymous with that commitment to light scrutinizing capacity. The intensity of color, the gravitas of specificity cast her black figures in a capable quality of light, one that avoids the need for either transcendence or realism. Indeed, Cheryl seems to use detail as an aesthetic condition that works against imposing a discourse on her figures detail as an aesthetic condition that orients a viewer to the intimacy of the figures and of the scene. Detail as an aesthetic condition that calls the viewer to consider the intimacy of Blackness rendered this bigly. It is almost as if Amy Sherrill's work comes close to resolving a long-standing philosophical problem, that is, how to see blackness in color. We could call Sherald's aesthetic mere beauty, though that might be a misnomer since nothing about beauty can be characterized by that evaluation, mere, and nothing in the world can be proclaimed to be singular and delimited in that way, mere beauty. This claim then that there is no mere and no mere beauty is a provocation that insists on aesthetic force. Sometimes things are refreshingly only what they are, poet Carl Phillips asserts in A Politics of Mere Being, his essay that inspires the idiom of mere beauty. How is it not political, Phillips write, to be simply living one's life meaningfully, thoughtfully, which means variously in keeping with, in counterpoint to, and in resistance to life's many parts. To insist on being who we are is a political act. Phillips, of course, is making a case about Blackness, and he sets the political as an antithesis to mere being, only then to reclaim mere being as a politic in and of itself. What then might we appreciate about Sherald's work through the false modesty and impossible actuality of mere beauty. In one sense, I'm leaning on the idea of mereness to suggest an example of quotidian surprise, the way that attention to some small thing, color, detail can open up the works phenomena. Take for example, Take, for example, a bucket full of treasures. Papa gave me sunshine to put in my pockets. The lobster crawling out of the figure's pocket is a quirky wonder, as is the sunburst rising just up to his collar. Together, they act as a punctum in Roland Barthes' language, the thing that pricks our consciousness and holds us wrap, or can if we let it. All this action on his shirt counterposes the centrality of his face, which flickers with a subtle expressiveness that is depicted subtly, like the five distinct shades of black that create his hair, his afro, his eyebrows, his eyelashes, his mustache, his goatee. Each one has a distinctive black at work or the way the flesh around his right eye seems slightly heavier than the skin around his left. His face is stark and typical and particular, exuding the quiet revelation of nearness. He, this figure, who is himself, who's not any idea one might have of him, who is not me. It is true that the modesty of the phrase mere beauty acknowledges the limits of aesthetics. The sheer fact that in a sturdily anti-Black world, aesthetics is somewhat inadequate 
to the social reality of Black life. Social reality of Black life is never going to be repaired by aesthetics. Aesthetic freedom is meaningful, but it does not equate to freedom in the world. That's true. Aesthetics is inadequate. What else is true is that aesthetics is essential. That mere beauty is indeed essential. We cannot live without these mere beauties. Three brief conclusions. I hope I haven't worn you out. I've nearly worn myself out. One, what if every reader is a critic? What if we think through the praxis of criticism that Bell Hooks and Toni Morrison and Horton Spillers gives us such that every reader is a critic, every Black reader is a critic open by and open to the encounter with the text. Surprise and disinterest loom. What if every reader is a critic? In this way, criticism then is not just the specialized act of our profession, it is the instance of any reader encountering the word and the world and willing themselves to behold what they're encountering. We might call this ordinary criticism. I want to lean on this notion of criticism as reading to advocate for the preciseness of literary study, study that enacts an urgency that is not necessarily the urgency of the burning world, but it is an urgency nonetheless. What if this idea of the critic is really that the critic is a lover and criticism is an act of love? We think that love says to the beloved, I love you as you are. But really what love says is I love you. I love you as you are, now be better. I wanna be careful. I don't say that the lover says be better. I said that love says this, that's an important distinction. We think that love says to the beloved, I love you as you are. But really what love says is I love you. I love you as you are, now be better. There in love is estrangement and maybe consolation. There too in criticism is the same thing. Not betterment, but estrangement and maybe consolation. If it is freedom we want, then perhaps freedom, or at least instances of freeness, lives in the aesthetic. It lives in the will and wildness to make a work of art, in the openness and thrall of encounter with a work of art. Freedom does not live in the political, since the political is necessarily about our shared being together, a constant navigation of the concessions we make to be together, our grievances of harm, our attempts to try to restitute something better. The political might offer a gesture towards equity. We might read equity as akin to freedom, but equity is not freedom, and freedom is not possible as a political ideal. Freedom or at least its horizon lives in the, art, in the artistic, it lives in the philosophical, it lives in the imaginative, it lives in the spiritual, it lives in the aesthetic, it lives in the body. Freedom is a theological term, not a social one. Socially, the best we can hope for is equity. Freedom is not in the world, it is in the aesthetic. Last thing, this poem, which will be the poem we'll start with tomorrow and which I might leave up if we want to talk about it, but I just wanted to give it as the end. Lucille Clifton, study the masters. Study the masters like my aunt Timmy. It was her iron or one like hers that smoothed the sheets the master poet slept on. Home or hotel, what matters is he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed too. Words, some Cherokee, some Maasai, some huge and particular hope. If you had heard her chanting as she ironed, you would understand form and line and discipline and order and America. If you had heard her chanting as she ironed, you would understand form and line 
and discipline and order in America. Thank you.